And um, I'm just bringing up the meeting notes. We have, um, since I've been in flight with no Wi-Fi, I haven't been able to check, but I saw a Slack notice that we have a email group now that is um, set up by the CNCF. So you all should have gotten an invite if you're on the calendar. If not, we will add it as soon as I can figure everything out. Did anybody see anything about that? I think I see it in my calendar now. So I think that's, um, I guess it's a good indication. I didn't get a notification about it though. I just popped up. Okay. Um, did, um, anybody want to volunteer to take notes today? It would be great to have a couple of scribes. I do it. Thank you. Here we go. Oh, and do we have a second? And just um, the uh, notes are attached to the calendar invite. I'll drop them in the chat. And so you can just add, who said I'd, I'll do it? I was not looking at the window. Lorenzo. Lorenzo, thank you. Okay. So um, yeah, as you can just dive in there and add, I'll add you as a scribe. Oh, I was writing in another document. <laughs> Great, so let's, um, I don't think we, so let's just start, uh, we'll do a little uh, stand up. Um, see if we end up with Dan and JJ joining us. Um, and then uh, chat about the, then we'll have the pr presentation from OPA. So um, I'll just call on people in the order that I see them <laughs> in the Zoom. Roger, we want to introduce yourself and yeah. say what you've been up to. Uh, sure. Um, so I'm product manager for SUSE CAS platform and container um, Kubernetes and, and originally specifically container security, but it kind of grew into the whole platform uh, at SUSE. And um, I've been working on getting a release out and getting, uh, getting audits and benchmarks into the release process, but not, but which has torn me away from the community for a couple of months, but I'm back. Yay. Thank you, Roger. Ash. Uh, I've just been working on uh, OPA talk for next week's KubeCon uh, and for today's presentation. So that's pretty much what I've been doing. Great. Brandon. Yeah, so um, pretty much also um, looking at the, the stuff for the open review um i think ash's document is very helpful there. other than that um uh, business as usual um we're trying we're still trying to um the encrypt the containers work forward with um, hopefully pushing up the oci um the o yeah oci uh the oci image back Great. Maybe you could drop a link to that for people who don't know about it. Um, I'm also kind of curious. How is, is the OCI also considered part of CNCF? Or is it no, kind of OCI is a separate Linux Foundation foundation, which um, I think actually predates CNCF. And there was an attempt, and it's was originally designed as a standards organization only though it's slightly weird because it owns the run C implementation as well. There was an attempt to merge it into CNCF, but it about at last year, but it failed for legal complication reasons come Chris tearing out his hair and so he couldn't do it. Um, <laughs> but it's sort of a, it's a fairly strongly affiliated with CNCF in that sense. 
And so what have you been doing with OCI, Brandon? I just put a link to the, it's the Open Containers Initiative, right? Yeah, that's, we, we opened the PR to, so this is something that I've been working with Justin Comic as well. It's, it's around the encrypted containers. Uh, we talked about this at DockerCon. Um, so we are modifying the OCI spec to uh, allow specification for encryption. Um, and part of that is trying to push it to the standards body. Great. Um, then next is Dan. Hey. You made it. So uh, uh, first and foremost, apologies for running a little bit late this morning. Um, uh, getting together uh, with the team and sort of uh, uh, aligning and making sure we, we get uh, last SIG security stuff uh, set up. Um, I noticed uh, as I was, uh, you know, doing some internal bookkeeping that, um, you know, some some of our uh, active uh, members, you know, didn't didn't get uh, um, uh, onto the the meeting invite. So I, I tried to sort of you know, coax everybody over, uh, and uh, looks like uh, Mark made it and uh, Tini. So great to see everybody, uh, and I hope everyone um, you know now has the um, the new time uh, updated on their on their calendar. Um, one decision, uh, you know, uh, to that uh, point um, that we we did come up with um, was to continue uh, with weekly. I, I tried to sort of merge the streams of of uh, having our working sessions on on Thursdays and the meeting on Fridays into uh, biweekly meetings where. Uh, we do our working session one week and uh, our meetings on another week. And you know, I, I think it was just moving too many dials. Uh, so having, you know, our, our weekly consistency, uh, you know, in, in this meeting um, at our new time, uh, I, I think will be, you know, the best strategy for this, the, the, um, the near future. Great. Thanks, Dan. Um, also, um, Dan, and Brandon reviewed our charter. Um, so I'll link that in. Um, Janie, if I'm saying your name right. Yeah, uh, that's how you pronounce my name, Chaney. Um I'm working on uh, for Fifth Third Bank, which is a, a regional Midwest bank. Um, just driving them to uh, the cloud. We're primarily on uh, OpenShift and um, looking at uh, GKE um, on Google Cloud. Uh, so uh, just a lot of things related to hybrid cloud and securing our communication between having OpenShift clusters in our data centers and on AWS right now. Great. Um, Christian. Hey, sorry, I haven't been participating for a while. I was super busy. Um, so one of the things that I have been starting to think about is, and that may actually be interesting for Cheney, um, we think that there is a new persona, which we kind of call the platform team, um, mm. that has been discussion internally here at Google. So a lot of the large customers that are looking at hybrid um, have a team that is responsible for making sure that all the policies they would like to express are available at all those different deployment platforms. And I don't think that is a persona we had on our radar so far, right? We mostly cater to the people that come after that, um, you know, the people that then use and set those policies. But what, what do those poor platform people do that get tasked with their bank and, and they say, you know, make sure all the deployment options we have allow us to stay compliant. So I'm not sure if we want to extend the, the personas we look for, but I think there is a distinct thing that is the platform team. And maybe Cheney can comment on that because it sounds to me like he is part of one of those. Uh, yeah, no, I think that you're, you're spot on that that is kind of a, an emerging persona that, that we're seeing as well uh just there there's a lot of um there's a lot of questions 
especially, well, from what I'm seeing, hybrid cloud is really just getting more and more unified from my perspective um, at where I'm at. And so it, it's kind of, uh, it, it's kind of setting groups uh, up differently than uh, past places that I've been in terms of a shift of, you know, who's your customer and how you need to pay attention to them. Yeah, because your, your customer is then the administrator, right? The customer of the platform team are the different administrators that you have. But if you say that things are more, um, sorry, I'm taking over the conversation here. We should maybe make that a separate point of discussion at some point. But a quick thing, um, do we, if you say that things are harmonized, are you harmonizing at the, the CNCF level? So essentially everything you can express in Kubernetes policies, is that good enough for, for your platform? I mean, that's, that definitely is, is a good place to start. I mean, I think it's good enough right now. I'm, I'm always, you know, trying to push forward at what's going to be the next level. Um, that's definitely what we're pursuing right now, though. Mm -hmm. All right. Uh, so, um, Christian, would you volunteer, because we do have an agenda for today, would you volunteer to make an issue with a, that describes this role? Yeah, that's nice. It might fall under the operator bucket, or maybe it's another one, but just write some narrative about it, and then yeah. we can start that. No, that, that sounds like the right, right way to, to go about this. Yeah, yeah thanks and, a lot. Uh, This is Michael Ducey. So um, I agree with what you're seeing, Christian, and so once you open that issue, I'll, I'll add my color to it as well. But we see this a lot as well in, uh, out there in our customer accounts. Right. All right, so then we have uh, Howard. Hey, uh, Howard from Huawei, uh, half wake, half asleep in China, um, focusing on the policy. So I'm the go-to guy if you guys uh, had the like similar uh, problems just, just mentioned by Christian. Um, yeah, happy to participate today. Great. Um, and Howard's also agreed to um, join J Justin Capos in the deep dive presentation next yeah. week. Thanks, Howard. No problem. All right, I have lost everybody. They've changed order, Justin Capos. Maybe people come in in alphabetical order. I don't know. Okay. Um, okay. Uh, so I've been busy with uh, kind of both sides of assessment work. Uh, both asking Ash a lot of questions, um, in some of them, and I think in a very Columbo-esque way, so a lot of dumb questions, and then just kind of, oh, one more thing, one more thing, um, and also been uh, uh, chatting with you and Justin Cormack, thank you for getting the Intoto assessment things together. Um, that's, that's been helpful from our side, so we've been working on that angle. Great. Justin Cormack. Yeah, so I, I was working on the Intoto assessment with Sarah um, and also the, the April one. Um, and then Mark Underwood. Oh, we had to skip Lorenzo. Lorenzo. Hello, um, well, I'm new here. Um, so I'll present myself briefly. I work on Alco. Um, I'm like since like two or three weeks. Um, I've been taking over as a maintainer, so I will be talking about that probably more. Um, and we just released um, 0 0.15 15 that had support for um, container D and fixes a lot of a uh, bunch of security issues on on Fox itself. So uh, that's my update for now. I will figure out what I have to say here in the next meetings. We were discussing the other day about whether we should take a look at Falco as a as one of the um, projects that we mm -hmm. examine from from our point of view. Yes, as, I can do that. So, is it, did you say you'd be interested in that, Lorenzo? Uh, yeah, that's what he said. Sorry. Okay. Um, that's actually why Lorenzo's on the call. So I actually saw Dan had shared out the meeting minutes uh, today. Um, and I went in and looked at the meeting minutes and saw the mention about Falco. Uh, and so 
I feel like the, the charters kind of changed from when we were safe into six security now. And so uh, Lorenzo is on uh, the same team as me at Sysdig, as well as another engineer. And we're all dedicated to the Falco project uh, and how we can make it successful within the CNCF. So um, whatever you want to do around that uh, security, um, I forget what you called it uh, in the document. Yes. Yeah, the assessment. We'd be uh, we'd be happy to help and um, you know kind of continue our participation in this group. Awesome. Thanks, Michael. Yeah. So um. So yes, I I think that we in becoming Sig Security, the goal it, it happened to coincide with a burst of effort around the security assessments, but at least from my perspective, was not intended to sh completely shift our focus to security. And we are still um, have a, a, a big policy focus. It's just a little quieter now while we're getting these assessments together. Um, but um, Howard and a bunch of other people have been working on a policy white paper and um, and we have another, we have a whole lot of other aspects of the group. So um, so I really appreciate you coming because we are, um, our security assessment team is working on developing processes and OPA is going through, is the first to formally go through um, this process that we have just defined by doing the Intoto assessment, um, you know, to kind of create the process. So, um, so good timing and we're very excited to have, you know, Falco um, kind of help us through this and um, be able to come up with artifacts that we hope will be very useful for the cloud native community in um, assessing the security of, of dependencies and deciding which um, systems to use in securing their um, cloud native systems. Um, so Chase Pettit. Sorry, I'm engaged by some urgent work stuff at the moment, so I'm oh. half listening. Do, you, do we need to come back to you? Or should we just, I was going through the list for check-ins. Uh, you can skip me and I'll speak up if I have time. Thanks. All right, great. Uh, Mark. Mark, are you here? I able to speak up? We're not hearing you, or I'm not hearing you. Oh, uh, you may need to push star six, Mark. I saw the uh, mute go How on. How about now? now? Yes. Yay. Okay. Hi, everybody. Hey, Hello. sorry. Uh, yeah, so those of you who haven't heard from me before, I'm kind of quasi representing some of the activities at NIST and some of IEEE related groups and in particular the uh, virtualized uh, and NVF community for which I'm the, the chair. Nothing really new to report though in this cycle, so I'll mainly be listening. Great, thanks Mark. Um, who did I miss? Robert. Hi, no, nothing uh, seems specific to report this week. Okay, and Michael Ducey, you introduced yourself a little bit, but did you want to check in about anything that's new? Uh, sure. Um, so we've uh, we've just been really focused on uh, the Falco project. Um, we're doing a lot of work around trying to. Um, we've seen a few users create use cases around building compliant Kubernetes clusters, uh, and using Falco and a few other pieces uh, of open source software to basically build a product offering around that. Uh, right now, they're kind of focused on um, HIPAA related compliance and uh, you know, medical healthcare related clusters. And so we're trying to kind of look at how we can actually start to take that and put it into practical guidance for people how to build these compliant clusters, whether it be HIPAA or PCI or whatever um, guidelines that they need to try and follow. Great. And um, is there anybody? Oh, TK. Oh, yes. <clears throat> I uh, was actually playing around a little bit on the security white paper. I'm still assuming that that should be still on the agenda at some point. 
I have not done too much. I have not uploaded anything, but I was <laughs> kind of started playing around a little bit, draft and extending uh, some of the things that are already were there. That's about it. I don't have anything else to report right now. <clears throat> yeah, um, the uh, security white paper is definitely something that um, is uh, often asked about, and um, I think that that we started a draft a while back and as soon as we finish the logistics with the SIG process then um, the then we'll re-engage with the writer who said that um, who's going to help us kind of draft and do the editorial around that but yeah whatever anybody wants to chime in on the Google Doc it's linked from an issue that'd be fabulous I'm glad you're thinking about that TK okay. should, if we have something new should we upload that one or should it, what how do we handle that so there's a, well, I think there's a Google Doc and I think adding to that. Okay, adding means, uh, yeah, adding means, you know, what I was thinking, whether I should, um, that is a second version, you want to keep the old record or how, I mean, I'm not sure exactly. Well, I think we have version history. Okay. okay. Although, I mean, I think that like, if there's, did you have another thought about additional content? Well, I, no, I was thinking like, you know, if I'm editing offline, and, and extending that thing and so forth. And I don't want to retype obviously necessarily in the Google Doc again and just upload it. Um, and um, just for the record purpose, if you want to keep previous version somehow or something like that, then, uh, then we may have to have a, some sort of way of maintaining that without confusing people. So I think that we, I think we can do that with version control. If there's some things that you think are, I mean, I think doing things with suggested edits and then we'll try to like merge things that are not contentious or of great debate and, you know, or you could add another section if you feel like it's really a different approach. But I think keeping it in one doc will be easier for people to scrub in on. Okay, I'll look into it, thanks. <clears throat> great, thank you. All right. So now I want to um, switch gears and um, give Ash the floor so that we have time for his presentation and a discussion. Unless Ooh, I missed uh, the anybody? Nothing. Okay. Should I share my screen? Yes, please. And do you have actually a link to your slides? Uh, not right now. Okay, we'll do that afterwards. I'll put a link to the doc in the... Um, in the notes, but if you would share your screen, that'd be fabulous. Can you guys see the screen? Yes. Yes. Oh, and also by for the new people here, um, if you go to the SIG security repo in CNCF, there there's a the process we're following a process where um, a group of us and it was open to the whole um, SIG to, um, to re, you know, Ash prepared a document. Justin, who's leading this assessment, Justin Kapos, went through and asked a lot of like, you know, sort of quote, dumb questions of clarifying questions. And then um, offline, we each read and thought about the security implications. And then the idea that this presentation kind of cues up a discussion about the security implications of OPA. All right, take it away, Ash. Okay, cool. Um, so I'm Ash Narkar, I'm a software engineer at Styra and I'm a core contributor to the Open Policy Agent Project. And so today we want to make it easy to enforce fine grain authorization in your systems. So let's get started. Uh, in this talk, I'll cover a bit about OPA's community, uh, a background about policy, introduce the Open Policy Agent, talk about its features, integrations, use cases, and then we'll see a demo on uh, Kubernetes admission control, and finally, a security analysis of OPA. So the project was started in 2016 at Styra, and the goal of the project has been to unify policy enforcement across the stack. One of the earliest adopters of OPA was Netflix, and they use OPA for AP authorization for their HTTP and gRPC APIs. A company like Medallia uses OPA for risk management in Terraform. 
and there, are, and there are more than 20 companies using OPA in production for use cases such as admission control, authorization, data protection, data filtering, and so on. A little more about the project itself. It's a CNCF project. We have around 59 contributors on Git. We have a healthy Slack community of more than 800 members. And just to give you some context, at the beginning of the year, we had around 400 members on Slack. And so it's great to see OPA growing and people liking OPA, and which is why we have more than 2,000 stars on GitHub for the project. And OPA is integrated with more than 20 of the top most open source projects out there, including a lot of CNCF projects, which we will cover later in the discussion. So what is policy? Policy is a set of rules that govern the behavior of your service. So an example would be authorization policies, network policies, and so on. Every organization has policies. And policies are essential for the long-term success of an organization because they encode important knowledge about how to comply with legal requirements, work within technical constraints, avoid repeating mistakes, and so on. And so policy enforcement becomes a really important problem for which we need to have a good solution. So when it comes to policy enforcement, a lot of companies will write down their policies in docs, in wikis, and hope that the policies get enforced. Or if you have a policy question, you will ask somebody in the company, and that person makes a config change to secure your system. Some companies even hard code their policies in software. And this not only makes the policies difficult to understand because they are so tightly coupled with the underlying system, but it also adds to cost because now, whenever a policy changes, a new version of the software needs to be released. So there are multiple policy solutions out there, but they lack the expressiveness that is needed to say what you want in your policies. Many are domain specific, and do not provide access to context or data that is needed to make a policy decision. Sometimes you want to know more than just an allow or deny or true or false, a Boolean decision. You may want to know which users are allowed or which fields can be displayed. Also, the policy languages in these solutions are not very sophisticated. They do not give you the ability to write functions, rules that can be reused inside your policy code base. So what we see currently is that the underlying system is tightly coupled to the policy decision-making and the policy enforcement process. And this is bad because it makes it difficult to audit policies, modify policies, and makes it difficult to gain visibility of policy throughout your system. So a better model would be to treat policy as a separate concern, like databases, messaging, logging, monitoring. It would be better to think about policy as a separate component in your architecture. And if you do that, if you decouple your policy decisions from policy enforcement, you gain better visibility of policy and security throughout your system. And these are some of the problems that the open policy agent or OPA was created to solve. So what is OPA? OPA is an open source general purpose policy engine. You can take OPA and you can use it at any layer of the stack in any system. When you use OPA, you are decoupling policy decisions from enforcement. So your services can offload policy decisions to OPA by executing queries. So let's try to understand this a bit more using this figure. Now imagine you have a service, and this can be any service. It can be your own custom service. It can be an API gateway. It can be the Kubernetes API server. It can be anything. So when this service gets an incoming request, it's going to ask OPA whether this request is allowed or not by executing a query. And so this query can contain the request path, the request method, the request user, basically any JSON. And so OPA is going to evaluate this query based on the policies and the data it has access to and send a decision back to your service where it gets enforced. 
And again, this so, decision can so be I, a Boolean, like sorry. a true, false, allow, deny, or it can be any other JSON value. Ash? So what I need to emphasize here is that OPA is not tied to any data model or to any domain. As long as you give it some structured data, you can write policies for HTTP APIs, for SSH, sudo, Kafka, because to OPA, it's all just data. Hey, Ash, I think yeah. someone's trying to ask a question. Sorry? Yeah, sorry, I, I don't know if my audio is garbled. Um, so, it, and I just wanna first make a meta statement here, which is that uh, part of the reason, like, in fact, the big reason why we're having this, um, uh, this presentation is so people can jump in and ask questions at different times. And so I wanna ask a clarifying question that I know the answer to, but I don't know that, like, I, I don't know, maybe there are people here that don't know the answer to. Um, so what does it mean to query OPA in this case? Where is OPA? Where, where is OPA? Yeah, is like, okay, so you talk about querying OPA, but what yep. what does it mean to query OPA? What does that actually mean from a code standpoint? Is, is uh, yeah, so go ahead. Yeah, so uh, there are multiple deployment models for OPA. So in this case, you can deploy OPA, say like a sidecar, you can deploy it as like a host level daemon, and you can do like an HTTP call to call out to OPA and provide all this as input in your HTTP command, in your HTTP call, basically. Right, and so there'll be different security concerns and different uh, potential risks depending on which way this happens. But there's flexibility in the OPA model with this, which means that there's, you know, there there are also um, like sort of different attack services depending on which of those models is used. Sure, yeah, so again, so we have a way to secure OPA itself, which I'll get to later in the talk. But yeah, uh, you have different uh, deployment models and flexibility with those and different security levels as well, depending on how you're deploying OPA. Do you have a preferred one? I mean, is there a strong recommendation? Uh, the recommendation, again, depends on your use case. Like if you're having like, um, if you're writing say Go code, you can embed OPA as a library. Or if you're having like a microservice architecture, you can deploy OPA as a sidecar uh, inside your pod. So it again depends on the kind of use case you have and the kind of requirements you have uh, for your specific use case, like latency requirements and uh, stuff like that. Thanks. Should I continue? Yeah, please continue. Okay, cool. Great. Um, so yeah, uh, so depending on uh, OPA returns a decision back to your service and so it does not matter the kind of policies you're trying to enforce as long as you give some OPA some structured data, it's going to make a decision for you. And that is why we say OPA is a general purpose policy engine. Now, so let's look at some of OPA's features. So at the core of OPA is a high level declarative language called as Rego. And so with Rego, you can answer questions like, can user X do operation Y on resource Z? Or which fields is a user allowed to see? So with Rego, you can write policy decisions which are not just Boolean values like allow or deny true or false, but you can also write decisions that are collection of values. OPA is written in Go and you can embed it as a library. You can deploy it as a sidecar as a host level daemon. It's designed to be as lightweight as possible. So all the policies and the data it needs for evaluation is stored in memory. And so you can think of OPA as a host level cache for your policy decisions. Your OPA and your service normally run on the same machine. And this is done so that you have low latency on the request path and you have high availability. Once OPA is deployed, it does not have any dependencies for policy evaluation, which means it does not need to talk to any external service or an external database to make a policy decision. But you can, however, make OPA talk to an external service for fetching policy and data, but that is completely optional. And what happens if you have a situation where there is something external and then now these things are not um, in the same sort of failure domain, so, or there's a network disconnection or something happens where they can't communicate? Uh, what do you mean? Like OPA can't communicate to your external service? Yes. Uh, so in that case, OPA is going to just return an error on its status API, and then it's up to you how you uh, handle that. 
um, is there any possible configuration to say that if it doesn't see a policy of the data, there's an expiry on, on it? So to just to keep freshness? Uh, so I, I didn't understand the question. Can you please repeat the question? Um, is it is there a way to specify that if you don't see um, an updated policy in say like a day, then um, you should somehow just that the current policy should not be valid any longer. Kind of just like a expiry mechanism in case um, you have some kind of denial of service attack on the policy bundle or server. Um, so you're saying that if the policy bundle itself is not available, like can OPA do something about that? Yeah, can you somehow specify to say that, you know, um, um, stop authorizing or send me an a, a event that says that, you know, I, I no longer am able to get the policy, talk to the policy bundle server. So uh, oh. I should stop serving requests in case, um, because it's the, my policy is not up to date anymore. Okay. Um, so OPA will report this via a status API and it will report it in its logs, but it won't do anything like uh, actively to stop it from downloading the policy. So it's going to tell the user, it's going to that, you know, I'm having a problem connecting to your external service and now you need to do something about it. So, but it won't do, it won't stop, uh, like download. It's going to keep on trying to download policies from your, uh, from your server, unless you do something about it. So this is part of something like a health check that the user can monitor. Yeah, so the, it's, it's the API which the user can use to check what's going on with OPA itself, what's the status of those bundles OPA is downloading. So it's going to provide all that information to the user, and then the user can, you know, uh, uh, do what they want from there using that information. Okay, all right. And so, uh, so yeah, uh, it does not have these run de dependencies for uh, evaluation, but you can always extend OPA to talk to external services. And speaking of which, so it does provide you some management APIs to download policies and uh, data from a remote server. It also allows you to update status logs uh, to a remote server. Uh, the status, log status logs include information about OPA itself, as well as the status of the bundles it has downloaded. And also it allows you to upload decision logs to a remote server. And these decision logs contain the policy that was queried the input that was given to that policy and um, the result of that policy query and uh, much more information which you can use for debugging your policies and for offline auditing of your policies. And so along, uh, finally, along with the core policy engine, OPA provides a rich set of tooling that you can use to build, test and debug your policies. OPA provides a unit test framework, which you can use to test your policies so that you're confident about what's, what you're doing in the policies is what you want. Uh, it provides a trace functionality, which you can use to see the steps involved in policy evaluation. Uh, and also to make it easy to author policies, OPA provides uh, integrations with editors like VS Code and Vim. And so just to recap, uh, these are some of OPA's features, a declarative language, multiple deployment models, management APIs, and a rich tooling set. So these were some of OPA's features. Now let's look at OPA's integration. So like I mentioned before, OPA is integrated with more than 20 uh, open source projects, and these are some of them. One of the hottest use cases for OPA right now is admission control in Kubernetes, and we will see a demo of this later. And so with admission control, you can enforce policies like restrict um, container images from coming from public repositories. So you can do policies like that with OPA and admission control. OPA also has an integration with Terraform in which you can unit test Terraform plans before they are actually implemented. Uh, with OPA and Docker, you can prevent users from running insecure containers. OPA is also integrated with service mesh projects like Envoy, Istio uh, for API authorization. Using Linux spam and OPA, you can have fine grain authorization over SSH and sudo. 
There's also an integration with Ceph in which you're protecting the data stored in the Ceph's object storage. In the Kafka use case, there are certain topics which have high fan out and you want to prevent corrupt data from being written on those topics because it will be read by many consumers. So with OPA, you can authorize which users are allowed to write on such high fan out topics. One of the newer use cases for OPA is around data filtering in which OPA does not return a result like an allow or deny back to you, but it returns a set of conditions which can then be translated to SQL or Elasticsearch queries and then enforced on the database. So I, I have a question here. Yeah. Um, so looking at the example of data protection, um, is OPA stateful in a way? So can it tell if I put in two transactions for $9 million within a second of each other? Does it have, does OPA understand that that violates that rule or is it just there's a single transaction that you need to authorize with your local information? So it's gonna be a single transaction. It's not gonna be stateful, uh, but OPA can take external context into account when making a decision. So if you have like this context stored somewhere about the transactions being made per second or like the frequency of those, OPA can take those into account to make the decision for you but it's not gonna uh, maintain a state for you. This is the trouble there with um, the consistency though, right? Because it's not a synchronous operation. Um, so I guess if you do something like that, you, you need some guarantees about the state, right? So, sorry, Brandon, I, I didn't understand the question. Uh, no, my, uh, I was just wondering because it, it seems um, based on the, the dots that it's or from my understanding is that you're obtaining the data from this endpoint. Uh -huh. You're making the decisions um, as they come in. So um, if you are relying on certain state because you do not control the store, um, it may take some time to propagate the information. So decisions may may not take into account the most recent state. So yeah, that's true. Uh, it, it's based on the eventual consistency model. Uh, so yeah, you won't sometimes, depending on the frequency of how you're downloading those uh, that, that information, how you're passing it to OPA, it, it may be eventually consistent. But what you can do is that you can also run OPA uh, in your existing cluster with some policies and you can find out the violations in your cluster. So you can counter that using a uh, audit strategy uh, if be because of, because it's by design it's a exist it's a eventually consistent model. Um, so with the re with the recommendation for this be uh, we should run OPA as a admission but also as kind of an enforcement um, across the cluster as well. So yeah, you can also do auditing with OPA so you can have certain policies which you can then enforce on your cluster. And OPA, the, and, and the way you write those policies, it's OPA will return the violations in your existing cluster based on the policies you've written. So in that way, you can kind of uh, audit your existing cluster if something which you couldn't catch probably before enforcement. Okay, yeah, that makes sense. Thanks. So yeah, so these are some of OPA's integrate. Sorry. Sorry, I, I just want to kind of like tie it back to my original question here for a minute. So. What, what can someone meaningfully say about the, the trade succeeding a certain amount? They can say that an individual trade can't exceed that amount, but do you feel that, you know, that, that OPA can provide meaningful guarantees to say that um, the volume of trades executed between 5 p.m. and 9 a.m. in the next morning from a single trader cannot exceed $10 million? Or is that something that OPA just isn't in the right position to actually be able to, to do? So OPA can do that given the right context. So like I said, you can feed any kind of context into OPA and it can make a decision on that. So if you have like information about this specific trader and what he's been doing over a specific time, and if you give that to OPA, it can use that to make a policy decision. But OPA itself is not gonna know what that trader has been doing over the last 
uh, given hours or between nine to five. You need Got to- Got it, okay, so, right. So it's, it's that context that has to be provided, but then OPA can just do the, like the check of the summation or exactly. the check of the actual value. I see, okay. Yeah, yeah. But, you but the context is never gonna be transactional, so. Sorry. Okay. Can, you call out to, can you call out to the server to kind of create a query for yes or no? Uh, I didn't catch the question. Sorry, Brandon. Uh, sorry. So, so this is kind of talking about um, this uh, scenario where you want to find out whether you can perform um, this trade, right? So if you have the data in a server, can you perform like external query? Um, which is synchronous to make sure that that data is up to date or, or you know because all the state is is gathered and it knows um, a more fine grained policy information there so oh, sorry what's the question i don't understand the question uh, oh, i'm just thinking whether because i i feel like this um the the situation that justin Kappas mentioned uh -huh. um, it could be be also solved if you could make a query externally um, to augment your decision that you're making. So in the case where you could query the, the trading platform and say that um, if I do a trial run of this trade, will it um, still work? Right, so this is just a simple example, but you can imagine writing more complex policies, which you probably won't want to do it in code. Uh, so this is just a simple example of like accumulating the policies, but you want to do something which is more concrete or more fine grained. I think that is where OPA really shines. I, I don't know if this answers your question directly though. I, I, think, I think I get the idea. Um, I, I, I guess the question is really about how expressive the, the policy can be. Can you take into account external for a reason to different services and so on? Yeah, it, like I said, it can take into account anything that you provide to OPA. It, it does not matter. Like It's up to you how expressive or how less expressive you want to make your policy. It's all up to how you author your policies. Yeah, and I think that maybe I'll just uh, restate it and you can tell me whether I'm restating it correctly, that um, OPA can take into account any inputs, like it, yet that it's all within the context of a single transact of a single call or query, right? Yep. There's a single transaction that or call that OPA is given context for, and it evaluates all of the data at that time. And if you wanted to say do things over a time window, then you need to keep that state. You need to track that, and that can be one of the inputs to OPA. OPA doesn't have any, that, that's not, that's outside of OPA's scope. Yeah, so, so you can, yeah. perfect, makes sense. Great. But you'd probably still have to wrap it in some kind of distributed transaction to make that meaningful across for this kind of case. So it's gonna be quite a different use case from the, from the normal kind of use case. Well, if, if each of your things were transactional, maybe. I mean, if they're taking place potentially simultaneously and. Um, yeah, then, yeah, it's. It's really, I think only that you would really only be able to do it from an auditing perspective. You wouldn't be able to block something from happening if they could happen simultaneously. But again, all these would be like a per request thing. So, uh, it's at that moment what's happening, that, that's what OPA is gonna enforce on, what's gonna take place at that instant, at that moment. Exactly, so like across multiple requests is, is it not, is it kind of outside the scope? That's yeah, that's more of an auditing feature. That's not more of like, uh, you know, because you need low latency in your request path, so this is more on per request than an accumulation of over time or something like that. Okay, so, um, so these are some of OPA's integrations and you can start using OPA with any of these integrations out of the box uh, without having to write any piece of code. So let's look at how OPA actually works. 
So we've seen this figure before. So basically your service gets a request, your service queries OPA for a decision. OPA looks at the policy and data it has access to and evaluates that query, sends a decision back to your service for enforcement. Now let's say you have a salary service and this salary service is going to provide information about salaries of employees in a company. And the policy that you want to enforce in English says that employees can read their own salary and the salary of anyone they manage. Now let's see how we can take this policy in English and write it in Rego and implement it in OPA. So like I said before, uh, your service provides OPA some input. And in this case, it could be the request method. It could be the path. It could be the authenticated user who's making the request. And so now uh, let's see how we can take this policy and we can write some Rego. So to make it easy to getting started with OPA and to uh, experiment with Rego policy, we recently launched the Rego Playground. Uh, yeah, so we recently launched the, is, is someone typing? Oh, sorry, I was should have been on mute. Um, I think that we only have, we have like seven minutes left of our official work time. I wasn't keeping an eye on the check-ins and I was wondering whether we should pause the presentation and, you know, and then you can kind of flip flop forward when it comes to questions or, you know, like to shift gears a little bit to make use of the last seven minutes. Well, okay. Uh, so I can show you guys a quick example of a Rego policy if that's interesting. So we can skip over the demo then. Um, it, Justin, you're- Yeah, I think that's, that's a good plan. Okay. So go, go ahead and show us the pol the quick example of the policy. Okay, cool. Can you schedule uh, additional time. Uh, and, and yeah, we, I think we should circle back and have another demo another time. We just want to make sure that we cover the um, security threats. Absolutely. Sure. So let me just give a quick example of policy and then we can go to the security analysis. Um, so yeah, so we launched the Rego Playground and uh, the way you write, this is what the playground looks like. You can see some syntax highlighting for Rego code uh, to make it easy to read and read and debug your code. So the way you read this policy is that allow is true if input.method is get and input.path is salary employee ID and input.user is employee ID. And so the cool thing about this policy is that the employee ID variable on line seven and eight will be bound to a value from the input. And so the way you provide input to this policy is by clicking the input button. And now the question here is, can Bob access his own salary? And so now if I check the output, allow is true, which means Bob can access his own salary because all the statements in the body of the rule evaluated to true. So now if say Alice wanted to access Bob's salary, in that case, if I say Alice, and if I evaluate this policy now, it's going to be false because uh, line eight is not going to hold true. So this is how you can write like a simple policy that says that an employee can see his own salary. The second part was uh, about the managers seeing the salary of their employees. Uh, so you can imagine this, you need to tell OPA about this information, like I said, external con or context. So you can store this information in your LDAP server and, hope, and have OPA pull it from there, or you can provide it uh, as a JWT token to OPA as well. So this is how you can write a simple policy in OPA uh, in Rego using the playground. I'm just gonna skip the use cases. So like I mentioned before, uh, it's a general purpose policy engine used for these use cases, and you can use it at different layers of the stack. Uh, I'm gonna skip over the admission control uh, use case and the demo, and I'm gonna go directly to the security analysis. So we are gonna talk about um, some attack surfaces for OPA. And so one of them is the uh, vulnerability on initial startup. So when OPA starts up for the first time, it uh, does not contain any policies or data. And you can imagine an attacker can access an unauthorized service while OPA is still loading. Uh, to protect against this, we would recommend your services should fail close if it does not get a 200 reply from OPA. It doesn't get the right reply from OPA. That would be one well, way to. 
when it starts up, what what state is it actually? I mean, it, what does an empty APA do given an empty query, or any or a full query for that matter? I mean, it it will return a non two hundred reply. Okay. Yeah, and so we hope that like we recommend that your your service should basically fail close uh, in such scenarios, and I think. Uh, that way you can counter this initial startup uh, of uh, initial startup vulnerability for OPA. Uh, second is OPA's API security itself. So by default, uh, OPA does not restrict access to any of its REST API endpoints that are used to fetch, create, and update policy and data. And it's possible that an attacker can corrupt the policy and data loaded into OPA, uh, thereby bypassing OPA's uh, authorization checks altogether. So uh, to counter against this, uh, OPA's API can be secured using TLS, authentication and authorization, so that your traffic between OPA and the clients is encrypted. Uh, your clients can verify OPA's endpoint identity. OPA can verify client identities. Sorry, and was that MTLS or just TLS, sorry? Sorry? Was that MTLS or just TLS? It's just TLS. TLS. It's TLS right now. And so, and so clients can, uh, so you can have certain clients being granted access to specific APIs or specific sections of the policy. And so, yeah, so you can have OPA, you can start OPA with like an authorization policy and which can verify client identities and then uh, control client access to OPA's APIs and data. The third uh, attack surface could be the bundle feature compromise. So you, as you guys know, OPA can be configured to fetch policy and data from remote HTTP servers using its bundle feature. Now the files inside that bundle are targz compressed and an attacker who has access to that remote server um, can cause a denial of service by providing a bundle file that will consume OPA's uh, server's memory and therefore crash OPA. So one of the ways uh, you can, we counter this is we've set a bundle size, the maximum bundle size, which a policy, a bu policy bundle can have. And so in that way we can avoid um, protect against gzip bombs. I, I think there's there's bigger problems here because I think mm -hmm. uh, we kind of we talked about this earlier, um, but as I understand it, the if if the party gets here, they can also add, change, remove, do anything they like with OPA policies, which presumably is very bad. If I'm if I'm getting this, uh, unless I'm misunderstanding something. Sure. So that's why. Uh... That's why we, you can protect a, OPA's API itself. So when you have that startup authorization policy in OPA, you can prevent access to certain parts of the policy and actions certain users can take. So in this way, you can prevent like a Bob from updating a policy, like, you know, for example, basically. So I, I would assume that if you want to secure OPA, if you want to secure the, de the deployment itself, you would have like an authorization policy, which, uh, prevents access to certain APIs and um, that's- Okay, but, but does it, are there untrusted APIs that will willingly open zip files? Because like, I guess if the, if Bob isn't trusted to provide a, like to change a policy, why is, why is Bob trusted to have OPA like uh, unpack a tarball? Uh, so again, like OPA does not, OPA assumes that the user is authenticated, right? OPA is not trying to solve the problem of authentication. So it's going to verify the identity that you provide for Bob. And it's going to give Bob the roles that you have set in the authorization policy. So it's on the user of how they define this authorization policy. OPA is not going to make any kind of assumptions about Bob. So it's, it's how you define that authorization policy and it's how you provide the identity of Bob to OPA to make that decision. Okay, thanks. Yeah. I think we're 
that I think we're already out of time. I don't know, Sarah, what we want to do here. I I think we need more time. Yeah. To to fully you know complete this, uh, you know, Ash, uh, you know, if if you're willing to come back uh, and continue this discussion next week, I, I think that would be um, you know the best way to. Or, or next week or a subsequent week. But, you know, yeah, week. or we could just have a breakout session where we, like we could do it in two weeks after KubeCon, or we could have a breakout session and, and wrap it up, whichever. So we can, uh, like, uh, I won't be available like for the next two, three weeks because I'm gonna be on vacation. So mm -hmm. I, I can I can come back towards the end of June or, some, or towards the beginning of July if that works for you guys. Or yeah, so not. maybe we can just offline um, schedule a regroup. And I apologize for not managing the meeting timing well today. Um, Justin Kapos, do you have a thought about? Or we can go longer, like if some of us are available. Um, yeah, I th we're in kind of a sticky situation here. I don't really know the best way to handle this. Um, we could try to continue for a bit. I think uh, of those who have had questions, um, are there people doing the assessment? Are are there people that are that have like burning questions that they have yet to ask? Are there a lot of those? I, I've got a question that came up in discussion, and I kind of like to put on the table at least because it came up in some of other people's comments and I haven't quite managed to formulate a comment for it yet, but um, one of the things that, that happens when you have any kind of policy framework is that people write policies that have significant bugs in them. Mm -hmm. um, so for example, um, I mean, I know that AWS have had a lot of experience where their IAM policies, uh, people write a large number of bugs and they can tell this because people have policies that can have large amounts of statements and that can never be true, for example. Um, so they know they must be buggy because people or people don't tend to write dead code in policies. Um, and Oprah is very um, unopinionated about your policies. It doesn't even have a default deny close or anything along those lines. And therefore it's very prone to potentially people writing buggy policies because, I mean, also the JSON is is untyped, so you have no idea if you've actually chosen the right bit of the input data to match against. Um, it'll just kind of um, potentially just give you an empty list, for, which could lead to a sort of cascading failure as well. And the and. I understand it does have tests, which is great as a built-in thing, which kind of helps, but this has definitely been an area which other, which in other policy frameworks has been a, a very large problem. Yeah, I think uh, this might now be like uh, op OPA's, uh, like uh, uh, OPA can deal with this problem alone. Uh, actually the policy team just, we just had a chat with uh, AWS uh, Automated Reasoning Group, uh, Byron Cook. So we are actually looking at like uh, building a open source solution for the formal verification of policies. I, I, I think which might could help address Justin's. Uh, yeah, I mean that's certainly that's certainly the that the, the automated reasoning team have done a lot of work with IAM policies in AWS. Yeah. Yeah. But IAM policies are a more strongly structured, so it's kind of easier, whereas open policies are very, um, um, I mean, it's a, program, it's, a, it's a program language. You can write anything you want. It's a much more open problem. I think it's gonna be harder. Yeah. I'd also like to say I'm skeptical that formal verification is the right tool for what you're doing now. I even think there's a lot of usability things that I saw when, um, the, oh gosh, I've forgotten his name again, that fellow who did the very nice talk in the panel um, that a lot of us were in in the security session at DockerCon. Um, well, that, we, yeah, that the, the uh, Tim, I think, or Tim. Tim. Yeah, Tim. yeah, Tim, Tim, he, he did that, he did a very nice uh, demo and things. Um, oh, that is not, someone is ringing. Okay. Anyway. Okay.
okay. Um, so he did a very nice demo and I, I think there were a lot of areas there in things he did and even just like watching that as an outsider there's a lot of sort of usability things and areas where it's like, oops, I made this error and oops, oh, this happened because of this sort of thing. So I even think that kind of shoulder surfing exercises to pick out and fix a lot of the more um, obvious initial pitfalls your users will fall into would, would go a very long way um, and won't require people to, uh, you know, do any formal verification of, of their policies, which people haven't really done. In so practice. one thing we normally recommend along with unit testing to be confident of your policies is that you have like a deny rules and then you do a bunch of whitelists. So you have like a top level deny or something like that where you deny everything by default. And then you have specific of these least privileged rules that you put in the policy to, uh, you know, only give access to specific things. So that's one way you can counter this. Uh, uh, one, that's one way you can write your policy, structure your policies in that way. That's one thing that we recommend. I, I think it can help. Like recommendations are nice, but but um, like giving people uh, like giving people access to go off the rails right away and just saying, oh yeah, you know, it's yes, it it looks really pretty here and whatever else, but you can just fall right off the edge. Putting some safety rails in place and making it hard for people to shoot themselves in the foot is. Mm -hmm. I think would help. And I don't think it would necessarily be that hard to do. Um, because I, I shared Justin Cormack's concern that there are a lot of, there are a lot of kind of programming um, errors that people could make here. And if, and when you have an act like a formal security audit, I, I think one of the really interesting things to happen for the auditors would be to look at a bunch of your users' policies to try to understand are users actually using OPA correctly or are, do they think they're using it correctly, but they just have really bad security. So this is more of like a user not writing correct policies and thereby kind of thinking what OPA is supposed to do and not doing that, 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 that use case basically, that's what we're talking about. Right. It's, it's like, PHP versus Rust. Like you can blame PHP programmers for writing buggy code. Uh -huh. um, and you can say, well, you know, Rust, like this Joe who writes Rust code must be a much better security person because he doesn't have a lot of the same problems. But the languages themselves make such a big difference that, yeah, that I, I think there's some meaningful things here. And so there, there are some things that could make OPA less, less PHP and more Rusty in ways. And so one thing yeah, we're doing I, right now. I was just going to say that, like, I, I, I wanted to um, echo that they were the, like, the, it started to go in that direction with the tests and so forth. And, um, and I, I just seconding that point, but go ahead, Ash. Yeah. Um, yeah. So one thing that we are going to come up soon is with a library of policies, which users can uh, use like these bunch of common policies that we've seen uh, users ask for, and they can then just parameterize those policies based on their specific use case. So I think that can kind of help in um, making those, uh, making the errors less during writing policy by the user itself, just for getting started, I guess. Yeah, that sounds like it would help. Yeah. Uh, so yeah. So are there other, um, should we shift gears and if there's, are there any other questions that people were, um, that were on people's minds that were different questions? So we know whether, to what extent we can do the um, follow-up asynchronously or whether we need to get together in order to fix the assessment. I only had a few more comments on kind of the document itself. So nothing related to um, the, the technology itself, but for the document. So Great, I'll, yeah. And Comments please the, edit and make comments. I mean, make comments and questions in the document itself. Thank you very much. Yeah, I've got, I've got to go, but I will make some more comments on the top as well. All right. So thank you very much, Ash, for your presentation. And we'll be um, syncing offline. And thanks, everybody, for your questions and attention. Awesome. And, uh, uh, thank you so much, Ash. You were really patient with all this. So we will. 
have some more follow up for you and give you both a kind of one pager and also a slide or so explaining what our thoughts are. Yeah, it sounds good. Uh, thanks for the opportunity. All right, I'm gonna close the meeting now. Bye. Bye. See some of you next Bye, week at KubeCon.